Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon session at Linux Conf AU 2017. Um, our first speaker for this session is Nathan Eggie from Mozilla, and he's going to, to be telling us all about GPU accelerated JPEG decoding. Please welcome Nathan. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so I work for Mozilla Research, and um, in Mozilla Research, I work on video codecs and video codec related technologies. So um, JPEG decoding kind of falls in, in those lines, and, and this is an experiment that um, was done uh, <clears throat> earlier this year, and um, right. So yesterday, if you were in this room um, in the morning, you heard Jack Moffat talk about the Servo project. So uh, Servo is an effort at Mozilla to create the world's fastest web browser. And so the way that we're trying to do that is we're trying to go through and take core browser technologies and parallelize them um, to take advantage of, of all of the uh, parallel capabilities of the, C, uh, of the computer. So for example, um, taking the style parsing for CSS and making that work with multi-core, uh, doing parallel layout. Um, the Constellation project looks to put multiple processors um, in use so uh, different tabs have uh, different JavaScript backend processes. Um, and finally, the, the Web Render project attempts to take web page rendering and move that to the GPU. So the motivation behind that is um, if you look at um, CPU improvements in the past 10 years, the So um, right. So look, looking at processor improvements over the past 10 years, uh, many people are concerned that Moore's law is over. So 10 years ago, we had four-core CP, uh, CPUs. And today, we still have four-core CPUs. But in the meantime, um, we've had die shrinks. And so we've moved from. 45 nanometers to, to 15 or 14 nanometers, we've gotten a bunch of additional um, transistors, and those have been used to um, add graphical processing to, to consumer CPUs. So for Web Render, the idea is we're going to move all the drawing commands from the CPU to the GPU. So um, Things like box shadows, gradients, and borders can all be done on the GPU efficiently. Uh, processing that was done on the CPU, where we're going to create um, rendered images and then upload them, that can then be done on the GPU. Uh, the Pathfinder project aims to create, um, to do font rendering on the GPU. So glyphs could be rendered on the GPU, and that can be shifted from the CPU. Um, but even doing all that extra work on the CPU or on the GPU. Um, we're still, you know, having excess capacity. So currently, Web Render can can do uh, full web page update, updating at about, um, you know, at, at up to uh, 500 frames a second. So there's still lots of room on the GPU. And what we'd like to do is is take advantage of that capacity and use it for additional things. So we'd like to shift additional load from the CPU to the GPU. So one thing that has a potentially moved over are uh, image de decoding. So it's reasonable to ask, like, <clears throat> are JPEG images worth moving from the CPU to the GPU? So for um, the majority of web pages, if you, if you, if you look at the, the use of JPEG on the internet, um, it's by far the most popular web format. So um, it has great representation for natural images, and that means that um, you know, people like natural images, so it's, it's used most, most often. Um, if you look at how many images are on web pages, you know, over half of them contain, um, you know, m more than 10 JPEGs. So being able to take all that decoding and shift that from the CPU to the GPU has the potential to, to dramatically dec uh, decrease load times. All right. so. What's the motivation for, for moving to the GPU? Like, why do we want to decode images on the GPU? 
So there are many reasons. The first, um, it's a massively parallel uh, system. So modern GPUs have up to 48 execution units, and each one of those execution units um, has the you know, potential to do SIMD operations. Uh, GPUs are continuing to advance with Moore's Law. So you know, while we're only seeing so many cores inside consumer products, you know, we are seeing that the GPU continues to advance, and we expect that to continue. So any, any work that's done to develop algorithms for GPU image decoding you know, should, should expect to get better. Um, also very compelling, you know, the output from image decoding that stays on the, the GPU, right? So once, once you've decoded it, like, that's the place it needs to be. So being able to shift that up there has the potential to um, you know, uh, put it in the right place. Also, um, images are, you know, unpacked images are, are rather large, so if we move to, you know, four, as we move to 4K and, and larger image formats, um, the unpacked set of, of pixels is pretty, pretty big, but, you know, the, the compressed version is actually rather, rather small. So if we can shift, you know, if we can just upload the compressed image, like, we stand to gain a bunch of GPU I.O. And then finally, like, um, for applications like web browsers where, um, you know, the, the demand to do all the decoding is done at once when you, when you load a page, the ability to shift that de de deco uh, decoding effort to the GPU has the potential to free up the CPU to do other, other tasks like, you know, layout and other, other things that need to be done when a page is loaded. So the strategy is to move the decoding of the GPU, or the JPEG, up to the GPU as early as possible. So what, what is the earliest point at which um, we, can, we can upload, upload uh, the JPEG data. So if you consider sort of a, just a generic um, image, pipe, you know, image decoding pipeline, you know, on one side you've got the, the image bit streams. These are the bits that come off the wire. And up on the GPU you've got you know, RGB and RGB image. Those are pixels. And the goal is to find this point in the middle as, you know, as, as, we're, as we're going through this decode process where we reach kind of maximum data parallelism, where we have the ability to then do operations to do the rest of the decoding, taking advantage of, of this massive parallelism on the GPU. So um, among people who are professionals in the image community or in the video community, you know, we believe that JPEG is alien technology from the future. It uh, was standardized in 1991 but it still seems to be incredibly relevant today and, and sort of prescient in some of the ways it, it does um, coding of data. Uh, by, by and large, what the JPEG we use today is, is pretty much the same as the JPEG that was standardized 25 years ago. Um, there are some kind of interesting, clever hacks in it and some optimizations. You know, as, as people have ported this to other platforms, there, there are things that can be done, um, particularly around uh, SIMD and, and things like that. Um, it's also widely extensible, so the format has mechanisms to put other data into it. Um, so you see people doing things like doing annotations or doing lossless or, or um, adapting it for, for formats that were never intended in 91. And also it's much better than you think it is. So uh, the Dollar Project started in February of 2012, where we first landed uh, some code, and it took us two years to get better than JPEG, just on still images. And that's taking, you know, that's using uh, all of the advanced technology and, and much more compute po uh, power than they had in 91. Um, and so, in, in general, uh, you know, when, when people talk about, oh, you know, you're using this old technology, it's actually rather sophisticated. Um, the, uh, the Moz JPEG project took a look at doing perceptual, you know, doing updates to the encoder for perceptual coding and was able to get, you know, improvements just, you know, even 23 years later. And of course, the most important thing is that it's royalty free. All right, so this is the JPEG decode pipeline. Um, so if we were to do nothing um, on the GPU, you know, we could just start right there and, and upload RGB uh, pixels. And so, um, this is, this is not exploiting anything, any, any part of the GPU at all, and, and it, you know, the cost to upload it is basically three times the width times the height. But if you look at the, the step right before that, we do YUV conversion. So here, um, in, you know, the majority of these, of these uh, image formats and video formats use this YUV um, uh, chromosome or, or color conversion than chromosub sampling because the there are more 
uh, much more sensitive, or th th there are many more rods in your eye than there are cones, and so your eye is much more sensitive to brightness than it is to, to changes in color. So we kind of exploit that with this YUV conversion. So uh, the idea is that um, if we did this on the GPU, we could actually operate on every pixel in parallel, and that would allow us to shift you know, four multiplies and, and six adds per pixel over to the GPU. Right? So this is, um, this is great because now we've reduced the amount of data we have to upload to the GPU by 50%, and we, we've reduced the cost on the CPU. Um, the next step is the, um, the transform step, where eight by eight blocks of coefficients are converted into, uh, from transform coefficients into, into um, spatial domain coefficients. This is done um, with a separable transform on rows first, and then on, or excuse me, on columns first, and then on rows, and um, using just normal, the, the, the sort of most obvious uh, fast decomposition still takes 16 moles and 26 adds a, to do uh, an eight point DCT. So on average, that means if you were doing an eight byte block, you know, it'd be four multiplies and six adds per pixel, or excuse me, per, per coefficient, because now we're um, in the coefficient domain. And so we could shift that off to the CPU. Um, but unfortunately now, uh, oh, there's a typo on this. So unfortunately now, um, we had to upload DCC coefficients to the GPU. So those are actually 12-bit coefficients. So now we've, we've actually made the upload larger. So this, this is worse than YUV. But we have shifted some, some execution. And so um, you know, if, if we thought that perhaps uh, the, the overhead in IO was worth it, like this might be a good trade-off. All right, the step right before that is, is dequantization. And so um, each, of the chroma, each of the color planes in JPEG has a quantization table, and you basically just multiply the, the quantization table by these, these coefficients, and you get your, your transform coefficients. Um, you know, this, is, this is one of the ways that, that we get compression in JPEG by, by uh, reducing the number of, of uh, about the size of the coefficients. Um, so anyhow, that's, that, this gets you an additional one, one multiply, and it's pretty much, you know, um, uh, uh, easy to couple with the, the DCD. So, still, still we were able to achieve data parallelism. So, we're, now we're at this point. Um, the step before that is this D zigzag step. So, if you look at how JPEG coefficients uh, come out of the, the decoder, they're sort of in linear order, and there's a fixed zigzag order. Um, this, this doing, doing the D zigzag is essentially free when you, when you decode because you can just put them in the right location. What it does is it, it, it puts all of the zeros at the end of the block. So when the again, entropy coder codes the end of block symbol, um, you know, it doesn't have to code all of the, um, you know, the, the, the zeros, and that's, that's one of the ways we get a lot of compression. All right, so we're now getting to things that, you, that, that may be harder to do um, on, a, on a GPU. So, so DC prediction. Basically, the, the DC value is the, the for every 8 by 8 block, the DC value is sort of the average color value for that block. And so DC prediction um, basically lets, you know, predicts, it, it, it says the DC value for every block is, is basically predicted from the previous one, so we're only going to code a difference. And so if you look, um, it, you know, in doing the decode, you basically have to do one add per block, but it's completely serial. So there's, there's ways of doing, if we were to decode all, if we were to decode all the, the DCs without doing this prediction, there are ways of doing kind of a, pref a, a prefix sum that would let us um, undo DC prediction in parallel, but it's, it's probably not worth it since it's just one add per block, and we could do that on the CPU. Um, but you know, supposing we did do that, let's, let's continue on back this decode path. So now, now we're looking at the entropy decode, and um, here we kind of have hit, hit, hit the end of the road. So entropy decoders essentially work like black boxes. You, know, you put compressed bits in one side and you get uncompressed bits out, out of the other side and, and internally it keeps a bunch of state. So there's really no way to, to do parallel uh, entropy decoding. Some, some formats get around this by using different entropy segments for different parts of the image. They'll break it up into tiles. Um, but uh, for JPEG, that doesn't exist. So um, one, one thing to, to look at, though, is, is what's coming out of the entropy coder. So Every time it reads a symbol from the, the decoder, it gets, a, it gets 16 bits. So 12 bits of that are that DC coefficient, and 4 bits are a length value. 
And the length value is basically how many zeros there are between it and the next coefficient. So if you were to look at just one compressed 8 by 8 block, um, looking at those, those sort of uh, value and, and length uh, pairs, it's actually much smaller than the whole block. So if, if we were to um, just upload this to the, the GPU, it's, it's significant, it has the potential to be significantly smaller, but we don't know how big it is, right? Sometimes, you, you know, JPEGs are much, much smaller, sometimes they're not. So, um, so, so one thing that I did um, after that was to uh, just do a random sample of 200 JPEGs off, the, off, of, off of the internet to see what the pack size would look like. And so on the Y, or you know, on the X axis, you have the size in megapixels. And on the wax, you have how compressed they are if you look at just those packed coefficients. And so um, that's a comparison to the full uncompressed image to R RGB. So uh, for 420 images, most of them are around 90 or 85, 90% compressed, which is sort of what you would expect. Like most JPEGs are significantly smaller, and, and um, we'd like to exploit this. So it's interesting to think about or to, to look at, you know, what are the images that are compressed really well? So images that have smooth content. Like, like sky, um, low contrast areas, those are compressed well because of the quantization and, and the, the fact that um, there's a lot of high frequency information. Images that are, are poorly compressed are ones with hard edges where you have to code all the frequencies. So um, now, now let's look at what it takes to do computation on a GPU. Um, so the WebRender project uses, or is, is limited to using, or, or is using OpenGL 3.1, and, and the idea there is that you have very broad um, deployment of uh, consumer devices that, that have support for this, and so the thought was that let's, let's stick to that for now, and maybe in the future as, as more devices have newer GPUs, we can look at other technologies. So what do you get with, with OpenGL 3.1? Um, you get vertex and fragment shaders. So the idea, so, so, so this standard is designed to um, basically do polygon rendering, and, and so you have this uh, programmable pipeline where you can update, you can upload sort of ver vertex shaders that pick what color a, a vertex is, or select a color for a vertex, and then you have fragment shaders that apply that across, you know, apply some kind of interpolation or whatever across the polygon, and then and tell you what the, the pixel value is. Um, there also is support for frame buffer objects. Um, which are targets that you can render into, and multiple render targets, which allow you to uh, render to more than one target at a time. So you can attach thing, you can attach you know, frame buffers that are not the screen, and you can also attach more than one of them. But all in all, you, you still have to do every algorithm, any algorithm you port to the GPU um, has to map into some kind of polygon drawing algorithm. So you know, think of drawing two triangles. All right, so if we look back um, at the, the JP decode pipeline, I mean, up, you know, why UV color conversion seems pretty obvious. You know, you just load each of the different decoded um, channels as, as textures. The vertex shader then sets the coordinate, and then the fragment shader picks the color. You know, does the color, and you use uh, GPU hardware to do this matrix multiply. So this is what that would look like um, as as a GPU uh, fragment shader. Um, the, the only thing to, to note here is that this is, this is completely generic. So if we use um, uniforms as part of the GLSL language, we can set the dimensions and the chroma subsampling so we can reuse this for any, any image of any size. And so, of, of, of course, this works. Um, this is something that you know, has been known and, and, and used for uh, uh, many applications. So most media players have been doing hardware accelerated color conversion. Um, in IE11, they were able to show that uh, they got a, a pretty big improvement with JPEG decoding by doing this color conversion. And um, the reason um, this is interesting is that, you know, while it's obvious that you can do this, it's, it's not obvious that you can do this inside a browser, right? Your browser has to be set up to, to get data to the GPU. It has to be set up to use, you know, the GPU to do um, texture uploads, and then those have to be available, you know, um, uh, to the compositor. and so. You know, in many cases, if, if those things aren't there, it's easier to do the decoding on the CPU. All right, so the, the next thing is actually a little bit harder. So um, 
we would now like to do the inverse transform on the GPU. And so um, the, re the reason this is much harder is that we can no longer really map it you know, as nicely as, as we could with, with the color conversion. So we're going to just try the obvious thing first. Um, we're going to just, for every pixel we're, we're, we're uh, transforming, we're just going to do the entire block. And um, you know, if you consider a grayscale image, there's, there's no color conversion. Like once you've done the inverse transform for that pixel, like that's, that's it, that's the luminance value. So this, this is what a shader that does that would look like. And so um, you know, the, for, for each pixel on that screen, you're going to basically load all 64 coefficients. You're going to do eight, eight of the vertical DC, DCTs and then eight of the horizontal ones, um, and then output a single coefficient. And so if you actually try to implement this, um, the, the shader barfs. And the reason it does that is that essentially um, you're using all of the registers, right? So when you have these giant arrays, well, there's, there's a, several problems. The first problem is that um, you know, arrays that are 64 big don't map nicely to, to the GPU. It has support for, for index, you know, indexing smaller arrays, but not larger ones, so it has to resort to, resort to um, using registers. Um, also, it does a bunch of loop unrolling for, for that, that load, so it creates a giant program and has a bunch of state in it and, and basically says, please do something different if you'd like this to run fast. So um, the idea, uh, yeah, that's what I mentioned there. So, so the idea to, to work around this is um, use multiple render targets and split it up um, into, into horizontal and vertical components, right? So, so GL31 has the support for multiple targets. All right, so this is, this is what that shitter would look like. And so, um, here, what happens is you load eight coefficients in a row, you do your inverse transform, and then you write out, you, you pack them in as RGBA and write them out to two output textures. Um, so, as, as sort of, um, and you can see the colors up there, you can sort of see where they map. And, and uh, after that, then, to, to do the rest of this transform for the 8 by 8 block, you have to do it in the other direction. So now you have as input the two textures you just created, and you have two new other um, render targets. Um, and uh, here you can see, you know, you're, you're, you're still packing things into to RGBA, right? So it's sort of one of the challenges of working with um, the, there we go. Um, with the GPU is that you have to think about everything in terms of how can I stick this into a texture, right? So you can't just, you know, write out, like, as much memory as you want. You have to kind of massage it into some sort of weird traversing of a polygon. So here I've got polygons of, you know, eight, eighth the width and then eighth the height. All right. Um, so this actually works. And we'd like to now add, quanti you know, dequantization to it. So, so one thing we could do with dequantization is we could just simply when we so over here, when you can see when we, when we load the texture right here. So when we, we load the texture, we can just simply multiply that by the, um, the appropriate dequantization value, right? So we could, we could store the, the dequantization table as, as uh, textures, then just do one multiply. Um, but it turns out we can actually do better than that. So if you, if you look at, um, so the, the, the DCT that I was showing earlier was for uniform output, but if you look at um, DCTs that, that do scaled output, uh, you can actually find some that are very fast, where they, they use far fewer multiplies, but they produce output that needs to then itself be multiplied. But because the DCD is a linear transform and we're compositing these two linear transforms together, we can actually move all of these coefficients out and then do, um, then, we, then we can then take that, that um, set of, of scale factors for that 8 by 8 block and then include with that um, your dequantization. And so doing that actually reduces the, the number of multiplies, which is great, um, and is uh, a technique that, that most software decoders use, right? This is a well-known um, well uh, optimization for, for JPEG and, and many other codecs. And one of the, um, one of the things that's, that's important to note here is that when we do this on the, on the GPU, we have the ability to do a floating point uh, DCT. So this is actually much more accurate than the ones that are implemented as integer approximations where all those constants are done in fixed point. Um, co codecs like uh, MozJPEG that I mentioned earlier use that integer, that, that exact integer approximation to do tweaking of the coefficients that they, that they code. So they'll do perceptual enhancements where they'll round one way or round the other way 
and they're expecting the rounding bias to be the same on the decoder. So one thing to think of here is while we have a very accurate DCT, we may have to think, you know, we have to think about doing it to mimics what actual encoders are doing to, to get the right um, artifacts. But you can still do the same trick with, with moving the, you know, the scale factors. All right, great. So um, this is what that would look like if you coupled it with that, horizontal, that, that first horizontal uh, shader. So you know, as, you, as you load your row, you just simply just multiply by a scale factor. And again, this is the sort of thing that the GPU does really well at. All right, so um, yeah, so so that, that, that's great. You know, we've we've found a way to do the inverse transform that that may be um, efficient, but what about the getting the coefficients up there so that you know to, to feed into that? Um, so the, the problem here is that we're still trying to map this to to polygon rendering, and when you do this packing, you have a variable number of um, uh, coefficient you know you know run length pairs uh, per block. So um, the, the way, the way to, to solve that is to basically create an index of them. So we can create a texture that has for each block, you know, a texture that's, that's block addressable, and then for each block it tells you where to start decoding this linear array of uh, run length pairs. And so this is what a shader that does that would look like. Um, the first thing it does is it, it reads from one texture that tells it the index into another linear texture. And basically, uh, since we're just trying to get the value of that one pixel, it will then uh, go through and linearly, you know, evaluate the, all the runs until it finds out that either it, uh, it's gotten, you know, it's skipped over the value it's at, in which, in which case its value is zero, or it's reached the end of the block, in which case its value is zero, or, or it finds the pair that says you are exactly this color. So um, it turns out that then, you know, that, that allows us to do decoding of, of the, the run length pairs. So that allows us to actually upload these packed coefficients. All right, so what does this look like in, in terms of steps if we were going to implement this? So on the CPU side, you basically would decode and scale the quantizers, uh, uh, excuse me, decode and scale the quantization tables. Um, you'd go through and, and um, extract all the uh, packed coefficients, and you'd build an index, and you'd, uh, then you have to upload those three textures. So that's that's the, the work that has to be done on the CPU. On the GPU, you have to go through and allocate um, all of the texture and frame buffer objects. You'd have to um, bind shaders to uniform, so kind of wire, oops, um, wire all of these uh, shaders together, and then um, do the do the execution in some you know in some dependency order. So this is what uh, that shader dependency would look like, and if this bothers you, it should because. This is kind of insane and not, not really what the GPU is intended to do. Um, so so uh, each, of the, each of the color channels is, um, is done independently. So the, um, the, Luma, the, the Luma and the two chromas um, all have to be done uh, by themselves, and so if you were to try to allocate all this at once, you'd have to have um, 19 render targets and 13 frame buffers. So if if you look at the GL31 spec, like this is, does, is not allowed. Like the max that you're guaranteed to have, or the, excuse me, the minimum, or the, the the amount that you are guaranteed to have on every platform is um, at least at least eight. So that means that there's some platforms that only have eight. So um, for example, on, on this laptop with, with that version, it, it didn't work. So uh, the solution is to take the three color channels and kind of pack them together. Since, since we're doing everything on a block by block basis, the only, only thing that needs to know where one texture begins, or you know, one, one channel begins and one ends is at that color conversion. So this is what, what that would look like. So this is, this is looking a little better. Um, but we still have you know, seven render targets and, and, and five frame buffer objects, which is still a lot. Um, oops. There we go. Uh, so if you look at the relative costs of um, these operations on the GPU, it turns out that uh, changing your render target is is like one of the most exp or is the most expensive operation. Um, this is a slide from a couple of years ago that was presented at at um, Steam Dev Days by Nvidia, but even at at um, 60 times a second, it's still 
you know, point, point 0.1 or point 0.2 milliseconds per, per context. So, um, you know, e even with, with five of those, like we're eating into a, a couple, couple milliseconds. We'd like to avoid that. So one thing we can do is um, we can remove all those convenience textures, right? So when we were loading the patch coefficients, we created a uh, intermediate texture that was just all of them um, de or uh, de zigzagged. And then on the other side, when we were doing the output of the DCT, we created a texture that could then be read by the YUV. So um, if we do that, if we, if we include the, the pack textures, we're now down to three, where we do this sort of unpack and horizontal DCT at the same time. And, and in the YUV, we also do the read from the, the multiple outputs. So, um, uh, the, you know, this is, this is better, and um, it's something that actually can be implemented, and so I did that. And so um, I've got a, a C implementation of, of this sort of GPU accelerated uh, JPEG decoding. Um, it has a multiple backends, so I could do some performance testing and compare the, uh, the decode times with this, this GPU enabled backend versus um, the you know, highest performance one I could find, which was, was LibJPEG Turbo. Uh, one of the problems with, with uh, LibJPEG Turbo is that it's been highly optimized to put out um, RGB and, and, and mostly YUV components. So if you want to get in there and actually get at, at parts of the, the bitstream efficiently for doing some of this testing, it's, it's rather, you know, it's not, it's not totally obvious how to do that. It has a lot of memory, you know, uh, memory management behind the scenes. And so I, I wrote a really simple JPEG decoder that would uh, let me kind of instrument it and get that data. Um, and so even though I only showed the, the full decode from packed coefficient to YUV, I actually have versions of all of these. So you can run it where you're decoding from, from every step. So if you want to see the comparison of going from, you know, just the DCT, like what's the performance of that versus going from, you know, the, the, the full stack, you can do that. Um, I wrote a, a couple of test harnesses, uh, which are how I produced some of those, um, some of that data earlier. It supports all the different um, formats. Uh, it, it also supports some more uncommon formats like uh, 422 and 440, and you can find it on, on GitHub. Um, the shaders uh, that are in there um, definitely have some more work that can be done to them. Doing, doing some of the, the testing, I, I found that there's still some, some places where the, um, the performance isn't what I expect, but I've talked to a number of people and, and believe that those can be worked around. So um, this is a graph of this. Um, the same set of 200 images, just looking at the time to do the, the CPU decode. So this is just doing the, um, the entropy decode and then creating the, the packed uh, and, and indexed arrays. Um, and so doing, doing just those and, and no more shows a 30% on average, for the, that's what the blue line is, 30% on average improvement over the fastest, um, the fastest decode to YUV out of, out of um, libjpeg, right? So like if you were gonna build a, if you, if you were gonna um, determine that you'd, you'd rather do things on the GPU, you know, your alternative would be to, to use, you know, uh, a YUV output. So, here we have the ability to, to free up 30% of the CPU and also um, um, uh, and also reduce sort of the GPU I.O. The other thing that kind of that's, that's interesting to look at here is that for, for some images, it's actually worse to do this, right? So like there's actually um, a speed up that was negative. And what that means is that the set of packed coefficients was actually larger than, than the image size. Um, the nice thing is that, that there's a strong correlation between the, the image size, like the, the, the JPEG file size to the, rate, the, the resolution, and this packed coefficient. So if you see that you're downloading some JPEG that's, that's larger than you expect, like you can just not, not bother. It can just go outside this path. All right, so um, yeah, so the, the, in, in conclusion, you know, it's, 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 um, it, it looks like there's something that can be done here. Uh, particularly in instances where we have a backend that's already using GL, like web render. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not entirely clear that that makes sense. 
um, within web render, and there'd be there need to be some profiling to see if if the the web environment itself make makes sense for this. You know, sometimes you get images that download slowly, and and um, you know the question of, of shifting the load is is sort of subject to some empirical tests. But it looks like there's something that can be done here. Um, other thing is that um, porting general purpose code to the GPU is is kind of ridiculous. Um, but it has the potential for, for being highly effective um, as the as the deployed set of environments gets better. Um, expect to be able to use other things like compute shaders and more general purpose APIs, so that um, I expect that even even if it's not effective to do this with 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 these shaders, at some point it's going to make sense to do JPEG decoding um, closer to the closer to the GPU. Uh, these are the things I want to work on um, next. So you actually could get better than this on the CPU side. Um, JPEGs have, uh, or many large JPEGs have restart markers in them. So this lets you um, resync with the entropy decode. And the idea would be if you have n, n, n threads on the CPU side, you could just split your image up into n segments, do all of the, the entropy decode and, and packing into these index and, and, and packed arrays, and then upload all those at the end, right? So you would actually be able to do an n-way speed up on that. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's um, truly parallelizable. And, and at the same time, if you don't have restart markers, you know, because all these code fits, like, because the decode is exactly that, you know, um, because the index will adjust for the, um, the packed order of your, your blocks, you can actually start uploading this as soon as you're done decoding it. Uh, on the GPU side, um, there's, there's some work that needs to be done to do partially downloaded um, JPEGs. There's ways to do updates to, to partial textures. And also, if you had multiple images that you downloaded at once on your web page, you could, you could batch those together. So even though there's, there's those um, render target context changes, it, it may not be that bad if you can do like 100 images at once. Uh, and of course, um, there's, there's also progressive JPEG, which is um, not, not as widely used on the internet, but it's still something that needs to be supported and, and, and looks like there's an algorithm to do that as well. All right, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. And uh, on behalf of Linux Conf IU, oh, a small gift. Um, does anyone have a question? Yes. And please frame them as questions. I, I saw you using OpenGL 3.1. I'm not quite familiar with the state of this, but does, does that mean that it will be available on mobile GPUs as well as desktop GPUs? Yes, yeah. That's, um, so the web render project is targeting that um, because I think that's, that's mostly compatible with um, uh, GL, the ES 3.0. So I think that there's, there's some you know, wide availability there. Cool. Hi. Thank, thanks very much for the, and thanks very much for the the work. It's uh, good to see someone thinking about that whole process of rendering a a page and how how we can make it quicker. Um, my main question was, uh, I was I thought that modern um, GPUs and things like that could actually natively take uh, textures in YUV and things like that, similar formats. Uh, I, do you think you're, do we need to do some of those transforms to get it all into RGB and then let the graphics card figure it out from there, or could we yeah. skip some steps? No, I mean, absolutely. So this, this is kind of like a proof of concept to see what's, what's possible. Um, there are definitely a number of uh, built-in um, texture conversion you know, uh, um, parts of the GPU and if, if possible, you know, using using their native YUV would be the way to go. Now, now you notice that at the very end, the last YUV conversion was actually pulling from two different textures. So in that in that case, it really wasn't wouldn't be possible to use the the GPU hardware. But you know, if if, if it makes sense, absolutely do that. Uh, do you have any uh, idea on how the equation changes of you know what's worth doing where if like you get much greater bandwidth to and from the GPU? or the GPU can directly address um, memory from the CPU or those kind of things? Yeah, I mean, um, so I, I don't have 
Um, a lot of empirical empirical data on that. I, I did talk to some of the people on the web render team who are looking at doing texture management, um, including including DMAing things up. So. Um, I think one of the one of the kind of open questions is how, how does this fit into the entire rendering pipeline, right? So if, if I were to if I were to you know look at all the operations that were going on over the over the the, the deco you know the or basically the rendering of the web page, you know maybe it makes sense to say well whatever we'll just do it here locally because I've got tons of time, or or maybe it makes sense to 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 um, you know. Uh, in, in particular, to, to, to move things over, even if they're larger than you would like them to be, just because you also have the bandwidth for it. So uh, about that YUV question earlier, it turns out that the OpenGL extension for YUV texture decode basically uh, got forced on the driver developers uh, by Android. There isn't actually a hardware support for it. You just end up writing shader code in the GL driver. Uh, there's no hardware there to help you. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yep. I had a question about uh, power, and uh, it, have you thought about how you might instrument the system to, to compute kind of joules per image? Um, I, I've thought about it. I don't have any uh, really, um, really good ideas. I know that part of the WebRender project, I mean, part, part of what this is exercising, um, uh, Will, will require to do a bunch of instrumentation, right? So, I think, um, you know, generally the, the goal of WebRender is to shift as many as many things to the GPU as as or to, yeah to, to shift as many things to the this processing um, as as possible, and then you know, if you're not doing the decode, the, the image decode on the CPU side, you could power down those CPUs, right? So I mean, may, maybe there's some trade-offs there that that makes sense. Cool. Um, thinking, thinking of the larger context, I, I turned this on my head and started wondering, could we write better image formats that would be able to be more GPUable? Are there, you know, are there improvements to, to graphic standards that we could think about? Yeah, so um, that's actually the origin of, of, of this project. A number of years ago, there was um, some some interest in doing uh, downloadable codecs, you know, using JavaScript and WebGL, and so the thought was, you know, what like in that in that environment, like what would this look like? Um, and so I, I tried to point out a couple of places in, in that decode pipeline where you were seeing where the compression came from, right? So um, J JPEG is kind of unique in that it only has one place where it does local prediction, right? When you do that DC prediction, you're basically making the assumption that your average color in 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 this block is is the same as the, the surrounding blocks. For, for uh, codecs that do, um, that, that are, are much more complex, have more com you know, processing power behind them, they'll actually do m model creation, they'll, they'll pull much more information from their local context. And so, um, you know, if, you, if you're trying to think of like, how would I design a codec that, that does, makes use of this massive parallelism, it's very hard to come up with a model where I do a whole bunch of work at once, and then at the end, I get an image, right? Like, I'm not sure how you would design that. Are there any more questions? Uh, one last question. Do you think this approach is equally applicable to um, PNGs and other image formats? Is um, that the future? I think that that uh, maybe as you get more capabilities on the GPU, there, there, are, there are things you can do. Um, there's somebody else at, at Mozilla that was looking at PNGs, uh, Patrick Walton, and his conclusion was that there was too much uh, serial dependency you know, with all of your um, uh, pixel predictors that there just wasn't room to do anything with the, the sort of um, large-scale parallelism on the GPU. Um, that doesn't mean there are not other formats that, that could be applicable to this. I, mean, I, I haven't looked at all of them, but um, that, that was one that had a lot of com complexity to it, and we would like to have done on the GPU, but it didn't seem reasonable. And with that, thank you very much, Nathan. All right.